That's what, uh, what was the main point of disagreement with Steven Spielberg. When I met Steven Spielberg, he was about halfway through filming Close Encounters, and we had a long discussion about what UFOs could be. And of course, for him, uh, the, the main point of the, of the movie was entertainment, and uh, it was appropriate for the UFOs to be extraterrestrial visitors. I think that uh, from my own point of view, I'm going to be very disappointed if UFOs turn out to be nothing more than visitors from another planet, because I think they could be something much more interesting. Something uh, from another dimension, a space or time? Uh, I think what the UFO phenomenon is teaching us is that um, we don't understand time and space. Mm -hmm. uh, here are objects, I think we have to call them objects, that are physical that interact with the environment, that cause uh, effects on the witnesses, on the psychology and the physiology of the witnesses, and leave traces on the ground, and yet are capable of, appear to be capable of manipulating time and space in ways that go beyond what our physics understands today. In your books, particularly your most recent book, Messengers of Deception, which is many years old, you suggest that UFOs are deliberately trying to manipulate uh, our subconscious mind, to create a mythology in our culture about themselves, which is one of the reasons that they're both physical and concrete, yet very elusive at, at the same time. Uh, do you still feel that way? I think to to answer that, I'm not trying to evade your question, uh -huh. but to, to answer that, you have to step back okay. you know, a, a little bit farther. The, what we know today about the UFO phenomenon is considerably more than we knew 20 years ago or 10 years ago. Mm -hmm. And we have to, to understand it at three different levels. Okay. And the, the first level is the physical level. And all we can say about UFOs at the physical level is that it's a lot of energy in a small space in the space of, of this, if we could take the energy of a nuclear reactor and contain it within this studio, for example, you'd have something that would approximate what a UFO does. It's a lot of energy in a small space emitted through uh, light energy and through pulsed mm -hmm. microwave energy. Mm -hmm. The second level is what happens to witnesses, what would happen to you and, and me if we were close to that source of energy. And again, now we, we under, we're beginning to understand the physiological and the psychological correlations of, of a, a close encounter. Yes. And those have to do with a, a loss of the sense of space, loss of orientation. I've had witnesses tell me we were driving north when they were, everybody knows they were driving south. Mm -hmm. They were disoriented at the time. Uh, loss of a sense of time, people thinking that only 10 minutes went by and three hours went by. Uh, a very often uh, effects on the skin, sunburns, I think that was clo uh, shown in Close Encounters, yes. effects on the eyes, going from conjunctivitis to blindness, to tempor temporary blindness mm -hmm. in, in some cases. And sometimes you've mentioned people have actually been healed of diseases. There have been cases where the, it's after a UFO Close Encounter, uh, it seems that the healing process had been sped up. Mm -hmm. Now there are known techniques now using electromagnetic radiation that will heal uh, the uh, fractures, for example, or will heal uh, superficial wounds on the skin, but nothing that would heal as fast as you know, the, the reported effects. Yeah. So we're beginning to understand at least the, the, the descriptions, you know, the, the, mm -hmm. the symptoms of, uh, of the exposure to whatever UFO is. And then there is a, a third level, which is where I was, the, the level I was addressing in Messengers of Deception, which is a social level. The and impact on our culture. Yes, and the, the impact on the, our belief systems. Mm -hmm. And at that level, and that's something that's very difficult to, to um, convey to the believers in UFOs, the believers in little green men from space, you know, that at that level it really doesn't matter whether UFOs are real or not. If enough people believe that something is real, then it is real in its, in its effects. In terms of in the, social reality. In, in terms of the social reality, in terms of what people act according to mm -hmm. their beliefs. Yeah. And uh, that opens a question of, really at two levels, uh, could the UFO phenomenon be manipulating us? Could it be a teaching system of some sort? Mm -hmm. Perhaps something that we are creating ourselves, perhaps a, a series of images that we are projecting. I think Carl Jung came very close to, to expressing that idea in, in one of his books. 
or could it be manipulated purposely by people who have the technology to uh, simulate UFO sightings? And mm -hmm. people say, well, of course not. Who would do a thing like that? Well, I would remind you that during, Watergate, during the Watergate investigation, it was discovered that there was a plan uh, originated in the White House to uh, surface a submarine off the coast of Cuba and paint the second coming of Christ over the island of Cuba using holograms. Oh, and, yeah. Which is well within our technology today. The idea was that since there is a large Catholic population in Cuba, uh -huh. they would be so upset by this vision that this would saturate the communication channels, you know, the telephone system in Cuba, long enough for an invasion to take place. How interesting. I never heard of that. Well, I think that's uh, you know, a classic in psychological warfare, but mm -hmm. that kind of uh, manipulation is, mm -hmm. is well understood. And I have personally investigated several apparently you know, genuine UFO cases where there was, in fact, a manipulation. My, my conclusion, the conclusion of scientists working with me, was that there was, in fact, a manipulation taking place and that it was not a hoax on the part of the witnesses, but a hoax on the part of somebody much better organized than I see. So there are possibly all of these levels going on simultaneously. Today, the, uh, t today with the current technology, that would be possible. Mm -hmm. um, one of my interests, as you know, has been to look at ancient sightings, uh, yes. old uh, sightings before World War II, for example, when there is really no confusion with modern technology. Mm -hmm. uh, and if people described, say, 1925 or in 1825, a, a disc flying through the air, um, then uh, you know it can only have been very very few phenomena could have produced it. And I mean, there have been some well documented sightings going back to the 19th century, for example. Uh, there was uh, starting in 1896 mm -hmm. and going into the spring of 1897. There was a, a remarkable wave of sightings of airships. Those were described as oval objects flying through the sky with lights on them. Uh, and of course, they, the people in those days could only compare it to dirigibles, mm -hmm. uh, could only compare them to airships. And uh, those objects were capable of doing all the things that UFOs do today, including taking off very quickly and making 90 degree turns and uh, landing and uh, occupants coming out of them. And if, if, any, if nothing else, uh, I think this is part of our folklore. This is something that we should be studying as part of our folklore. Mm -hmm. What have you been doing since the publication of Messengers of Deception? Well, I've been doing, really working in, in two directions. Mm -hmm. uh, I think that one of the contributions that I can make is trying to develop or to, to help develop new methodology to deal with this phenomenon. This is not, we don't know where the phenomenon belongs. We don't know if it should be part of psychology or part of physics or part of meteorology or astronomy. Um, we need to develop, a, and it takes a while for science to develop new disciplines around phenomena that don't fit. Mm -hmm. and I think that's one of the opportunities with the UFO phenomenon. So I've tried to develop methodology that would enable us to, to deal with the complexity of the reports. Mm -hmm. And I'm doing this uh, right now in using artificial intelligence techniques to develop a very simple screening model we, we do know one thing we, everybody agrees on is that 80% of all the cases reported are not UFOs, that they are explainable phenomena. So if you type so the data of these cases into a computer, the computer will probably screen that 80% out. Exactly. The, uh -huh. not, maybe not the 80%, but if you could just eliminate the 60% and okay. put them into lower priorities, mm -hmm. you would save a lot of time of investigators who could go after the the high strangeness cases mm -hmm. or high priority cases. So that's what I've been doing. As a byproduct of that, you get information on the structure of the phenomenon, the structure of the knowledge about the phenomenon mm -hmm. that I think is, is going to give us some insights into how to, to approach it. The other thing I've been doing is personal investigations. Mm -hmm. And I don't belong to any group uh, or to any organization whatsoever. I'm doing this strictly on my own with a small network of friends and uh, mm -hmm. scientists and other investigators who help me. And uh, I've been I'm fairly frequently in, in Europe. I've also traveled to South America and, of course, within the U.S. And I've tried to investigate cases that had not been reported to the media. Mm 
-hmm. have not been reported to UFO organizations. To avoid possible contamination from other researchers who may have made suggestions. Exactly. Mm -hmm. or, or simply the, the pressures on the witnesses themselves yeah. to embellish their stories yeah. and so on. So I, I try to go after cases that are reported directly to me. Mm -hmm. Have and, you come up um, with anything new or interesting in these cases? Uh, yes. Mm -hmm. uh, I go after cases where I have continued access to the witnesses and mm -hmm. continued access to the site where I can go back month after month or year after year and continue to follow those cases. Mm -hmm. One case that I'm especially intrigued with that I'm continuing to follow is the case of Dr. X in France. That's uh, an interesting one because I know I interviewed you in 1973 about this very interesting case. Well, it's a case that goes back to 1968. Mm -hmm. uh, the witness is a medical doctor of some reputation in the south of France, which is why he never wanted his name published in connection with the sighting, so yes. he was referred to as Dr. X. One night he uh, saw some uh, f flashes of red light behind the shutters in his house, and uh, so he opened the, the windows and stepped out on his balcony in the middle of the night and saw two objects that appeared to merge into a single object, and a, a beam of light went through the, the balcony where he was standing. Uh, the uh, being a scientist, uh, being a medical doctor, he had made a number of observations that during the sighting that enabled the investigators later to reconstruct exactly where the object had been mm -hmm. and the apparent size of the object. And the object was apparently very large. Uh, one of the interesting sequelae of the, of the incident is that there was a um, stigma or a marking that developed on, over his abdomen and also over the abdomen of his yes. son. Mm -hmm. His son was 18 months old at the time. Um, over the years, that that uh, area of uh, it was like a, a red uh, geometric shape mm -hmm. uh, over over right the skin, over the over the stomach. Over the stomach. Mm -hmm. uh, this has been now filmed on recurrent years. Uh, it comes on back the, on the anniversary on an of that uh, basis. on the anniversary of that sighting. Now the that would be hard to explain in physiological terms. I should think uh, there have been several attempts to. Of course, he has. This has been observed by his colleagues in France. Mm -hmm. uh, one of them wanted to write up a communication to the French Academy of Medicine, uh, except that that couldn't be done without naming the witness, mm -hmm. and he did not want to be named. The I've spoken to several people who continue to follow the case yes. in France, and I, I met him last year again. Mm -hmm. uh, the, the markings continue to appear. Even after over 18 years. And there is no, uh, this cannot be explained as psychosomatic. Mm -hmm. and there is a, an actual change. Uh, now, when I interviewed you about this many, many years ago, you indicated to me that Dr. X seemed to have acquired uh, certain psychic gifts. In fact, his whole life was changed, his attitudes changed. That's mm -hmm. not unusual. Many mm -hmm. of the, when you investigate a case like this, what you find is usually a, a witness who is in a, in a state of trauma, uh, has been shocked into very often their, their view of themselves, their view of the world around them, their view of the universe has been shattered mm -hmm. by this experience. Whether they are religious or not religious, uh, whether they are you know, a, a cop driving on a lonely road or a PhD or a bank president, I mean, they, they go through this very shattering experience. And people react, many people react with an awareness of uh, abilities that they didn't know they had before. They, they will tell you, I don't think the, the experience itself gave me that ability, but it, I just became aware of that there was more to life than what I thought before. Well, now, well, having had time to look back, have these changes been well integrated into his life, would you say? Uh, it's very difficult to answer that question. Mm -hmm. It's, uh, I know him, I think, fairly well. Um, he has um, certainly continued to, to hold to that belief mm -hmm. that uh, there was another dimension to life. Mm -hmm. Uh, his whole, uh, he's become almost a mystic in terms mm -hmm. of his awareness of life and death and, uh, and uh, the, the place of man in the universe. At the same time, he has developed um, a belief system that is difficult for, for me to, to accept, mm -hmm. in which he no longer he has no critical 
awareness of the phenomenon anymore. In other words, he's accepted it totally in his life. The way a mystic would accept. He's developed a religious attitude. Almost a religious attitude. And that's mm -hmm. very difficult. I mean, I, I, respect, I have to respect that. Mm -hmm. But it makes it very difficult for a scientist to, to preserve a, a distance towards Except the Except if you look at it maybe as a, as a social phenomenon, as you, as you have in the past. That yes, this may you, be you, part of the phenomenon itself. Exactly. You, you have to shift your point of view to, to a social point of view. Mm -hmm. How about the case for, for physical evidence for UFOs? Is it getting better? This is the one thing that we often hear from NASA and from other skeptics, that there really isn't a, a shred, as they say, of, of physical evidence. Well, I brought you a, a photograph that mm -hmm. um, I recently was in Costa Rica, uh, looking, investigating some cases and uh, talking to investigators there. And I have not done extensive analysis yet on this photograph, but it shows um, a, an Perhaps object. Perhaps we can uh, have our viewers look at that. Uh, it shows an object seen over um, the ocean off the, the coast of Costa Rica. What is unusual about the photograph is that it was taken by a mapping aircraft with an excellent camera, and it's uh, shown looking down. Mm -hmm. The camera was obviously pointing down, and the, the aircraft was flying horizontally at uh, 3,000 meters. Which is rather the, low. Which is, uh, at th at that altitude gives very, very good detail on the terrain mm -hmm. and, on the, uh, and also on the object. Yeah. Now, the, the one explanation that we tried to pursue was that the object might have been the, the rotor of a helicopter flying underneath the aircraft. Uh -huh. but with it doesn't the, look like that. It doesn't look like that, That's the, but uh, nothing else looks like that either, mm -hmm. so that's where we are. I see. There will obviously be a, you know, further analysis uh, done on this. And you've been to Costa Rica yourself on investigations? Yes. Mm -hmm. uh, there is a, in every country, uh, still today, uh, there is active, well, this is a phenomenon that goes through waves. It yes. goes through periods of intense activity. We are clearly all over the world, things are relatively quiet. Yeah. But in uh, practically every country, mm -hmm. you will find if you, you have to, to look for those reports, but the, the reports are there and uh, the phenomenon continues to be manifesting. And France, where you're from, is, is one of the stronger countries in this area, aren't they? Yes. Uh, what is happening, though, is that people are, because of the, the attitude of the scientific community being very negative on mm -hmm. the, the topic itself, that people are just not reporting what they see anymore. Mm -hmm. And uh, so the, we're losing the opportunity to, to obtain good data about the phenomenon. France may be the exception, because in France, uh, for many years, there has existed a, uh, an organization mm -hmm. called GEPAN, called GEPAN, G-E-P-A-N, which mm -hmm. is uh, a, a subset of the, the French equivalent of NASA, the CNES, the mm -hmm. French Committee for Space Studies, and they have uh, funds and a small staff. This is not by any means a large organization, but they do have a budget to investigate UFO reports, uh, especially those coming through the police and the gendarmerie in mm -hmm. France. So the procedure is very well established. GEPAN has contacts with every part of the French government and receives um, all the sightings that and I understand in Brazil there was at one time some official acknowledgement of UFOs. There have been, in fact, I was in France last year at a, a briefing of uh, GEPAN and the, the staff of CNES on uh, the UFO phenomenon as seen from, from the United States. Mm -hmm. And I was there with uh, Professor Heineck, who since has, has died unfortunately, yes. and with a, a medical doctor who is with the U.S. Air Force and has been very interested in cases like the Dr. X case. And we, we briefed, we had, there was a very two-day exchange of views with, uh, with the people at JPO. Mm -hmm. uh, there is a, uh, you know, a considerable amount of data that has been uh, gathered by, by those organizations. JPO had been approached 
officially by several countries wanting to use JPO as a model to do the same thing in their own now countries. You several mentioned countries in Latin America. CNAS. CNES. Uh, that's the, the French NASA. Oh, I see. They are the people responsible for uh -huh. Ariane, you know, for Ariane Espace, the uh, Ariane rocket. Oh, yes. And uh -huh. uh, they are the people responsible for Spot Image, which is a, a new satellite for. Mm -hmm. Uh, for exploration of the Earth. Well, certainly the European Space Program seems to be making some strides now. Yes. For a while there was a, a committee in the Soviet Union that mm -hmm. was active in UFO research. I don't know what the status, what mm -hmm. the current status of that committee is. You, we're not hearing a lot from the Soviet Union. Uh, there is active interest. Uh -huh. There is an active, as, as I understand it, an active mm -hmm. exchange of correspondence between the Soviet Union and mm -hmm. France on this topic. I thought I heard some years ago an official pronouncement by the Brazilian government that this is an area that should be looked into. Brazil has always been uh, interested in the phenomenon. There are remarkable cases in Brazil. Uh, I had the opportunity to reinvestigate a case in Brazil where two people had died mm -hmm. uh, during, I don't want to say as a result, but so during in a sighting? coincidence with a, a sighting of a UFO over, mm -hmm. uh, sighted by many people over a wide area. Uh, and I had the full cooperation of the uh, police department in Rio. Mm -hmm. uh, and the, you know, they, sent, they have a, a detective who was uh, detached to continue to, to study this case and to gather information about that case. In, here in the United States, are there, are there any trends that would distinguish us from the kind of reports you find around the world? Or are they all similar? The reports in the U.S. are absolutely indistinguishable from those in other parts of the world. And mm -hmm. That's one of the remarkable things about this Because you might otherwise expect phenomenon. cultural differences. Uh, there are very few. Co there are differences in the way it is phenomenon is reported, and yes. the way it is treated by the media. Mm -hmm. uh, in the U.S., the media tends to polarize everything. So either you 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 have to be for or against UFOs. You know, you you have to be uh, you have to be either you believe in them, in which case you believe in extraterrestrials, or you don't believe in them. And it's very difficult to to take a middle position, mm -hmm. to say this is a phenomenon that does exist and, and we don't understand it and it may be extraterrestrial but it's probably something else. Mm -hmm. When you talk to the witnesses in every country, including the US, what they are telling you is that they have seen something that was there, that was part of their reality, part of their physical reality, and yet was capable of appearing out of nowhere or disappearing, into, disappearing instantly. And uh, that's why I'm, I'm interested. I think it's a challenge to our concept of science, to mm -hmm. our concept of technology. Uh, my business is technology. I cannot afford not to. Um, I cannot afford to um, ignore this phenomenon. Do you anticipate then that there may be some major impact on our, our culture as a result of this? I think even if we never understood the UFO phenomenon in the next 200 years, but we only understood how they manipulate the uh, pulsed microwaves, for example, that itself would be a breakthrough in our technology if we could only duplicate what, what that phenomenon does. The, I haven't heard much about this pulsed microwaves. Is this a new discovery? Uh, it's a convergence of, of work by several people looking both at the, the traces left on the ground, the mm -hmm. impact on witnesses, uh, the, the sounds and the, the uh, visual effects that seem to be produced inside the brain, the, the heating that is produced on, on cars or metal or the ground in the vicinity of the, of the object or in the vicinity of the phenomenon. All this strongly suggests pulsed microwave radiation in connection with, with light radiation. One of the suggestions, Jacques, that you made in your book, The Invisible College, as I recall, is, is that the UFOs may be associated with some of the mystical or occult ideas of uh, Oh, hidden masters or, or groups of very wise and beneficent entities that were trying to teach humanity. Yeah. Uh, I, didn't, I didn't take it that far. Okay. I suggested that first any new phenomenon, mm -hmm. uh, even you know, if you go back to the 15th century uh, when you look at electricity, for example, electrostatics as it was observed then but not understood, 
has the potential of being regarded as magical. Yes. I think Arthur Clarke said that any technology that we don't understand has to be magic, has to be perceived as magical. I'm, I'm paraphrasing mm -hmm. badly what, what he said. Uh, I mean, clearly, here is a phenomenon that is very complex and uh, is showing abilities that we cannot duplicate with our current technology. So it immediately calls to mind magic you know, and, and occultism. Yes. If it it also contains the something that electrostatics and electromagnetism doesn't contain, the potential of being intelligent. Mm -hmm. If it is intelligent, uh, then we may not be able to study it with science alone. I mean, science is a, is a way of gaining knowledge based on uh, phenomena that are not manipulated by an intelligence. Mm -hmm. If now there is an intelligence involved, then it becomes much more complex. It requires a humanistic approach. And yes, it requires a much more diverse approach from many different disciplines, and it may be that the people responsible for that manifestation understand the impact that the phenomenon will have on, on us, mm -hmm. on our own imagination. And that's one of the speculations that I proposed, was that perhaps the observations of UFOs were similar to a teaching system. To a, but there is another way of thinking about that. Perhaps uh, you know we're, we're clearly in uh, at a time of great potential crisis on Earth. Mm -hmm. We have the means of destroying the planet, which we've never had before in the history of man. Uh, it may be that there is a collective unconscious. Mm -hmm. Uh, if you, if you the UFOs the union, are ourselves, perhaps. Or that, that we are creating the visions we need to survive I in see. order to transcend mm -hmm. this crisis we have, and that there are no UFOs in a, in a manufactured sense. Mm -hmm. um, well, Jacques, we're out of time now, but it's really been a pleasure, and this is an interesting note to end on. There's so much that could be said about this topic. Thank you very much for being with us. Well, thank you for giving me the opportunity to pursue this subject with you. And thank you very much for joining us also.